Hi everybody, I am Matthew Miller, the Fedora Project Leader, and this is the special Director's Cut presentation of the State of Fedora talk at DevConf in Brno for 2016. I'm going to start off with some beautiful quotes from the press that we had over this last year as they're looking back at Linux over the year of 2015. They said some things about us. This one is from Pharonix, which is a Linux enthusiast hardware gaming site, which traditionally has been a little hard on us, I think, but recently, uh, especially with the things we've been doing, uh, they've come around and, and love us a lot. So um, this is some nice things they said here. And then this one is from the register, which is a kind of uh, IT tabloid, talks about technology and often tends towards snarkiness. And so I am actually really proud of this one because uh, not only when they did their year in the review, uh, they're not snarky at all. They only have nice things to say about us. And in, further, it's actually some things I'm really glad to hear, not just that, wow, they did a good job of putting together another operating system release, but that the project altogether with the efforts we've been doing in Fedora Next is uh, in heading in a good direction. So I am really happy and proud of the entire community uh, for this quote here. So the first part of my talk here is kind of a Fedora by the numbers. So uh, let's get started with that. Uh, first, we have some numbers about downloads and connections and things like that. And whenever I do this, I start my thing with a scary dinosaur slide. This is because Steven Smugin, who's the Fedora infrastructure um, Uber sysadmin who put together a lot of the stats that underlie this, um, really would like them to be shared with caveats. Particularly the caveats have to do with the y-axis, the actual bare counts of things, and I'll go a little bit into the methodology of that, but basically, um, like tracking dinosaurs in the wild, uh, we are not actually doing direct surveillance of people, we're kind of doing uh, second order metrics where we observe things and try to extrapolate from there what we can find out. We don't have like some operating systems things which log every keystroke and send them to you. Um, we value privacy as an important part of Fedora. So uh, we also have a pretty strong need to make sure that we're succeeding because um, if you can't tell how well you're doing, how can you tell what you should be doing differently? So we do, we do want to count people, but we want to do it in a way that's sensitive to people's privacy needs. Um, so as part of that, um, we can't really guarantee that the y-axis means anything in absolute terms, but we do think that it has some usefulness in, rel in relative terms. So here is the first scary slide, um, and this is basically kind of a raw data version of this. This is going back to May of 2007, all the way up to approximately now, and this is the connection counts for uh, our update server for every release, starting with Fedora Core 6, going all the way up to um, the beginning spike of Fedora 23 there. And so what we're counting here, because this is the director's cut, I'll go into the geeky detail of it. Uh, we have a mirror manager where basically Fedora updates are distributed from volunteer mirrors all over the world. Uh, and that gives us a lot of, like, it's a Thank you very much to all of our volunteer mirror admins because it's a lot of bandwidth and it would be really hard to do Fedora with, get Fedora to people without that. And the thing that when you, as a user, update your software or install new software or check for updates, uh, we have a thing called Mirror Manager. You connect to it, or you know the command you're running connects to it. You don't have to know about this when you do it, but it's what happens behind the scenes. It connects us and it tells you where your closest mirror to get that software is. And so what we're measuring here is connections to that mirror manager per IP address per day. And so this is where some of the things you get into um, the, the problem with you know, what, whether, what this number exactly means. So we can see it, it goes up to about 100,000 there. And we think there are more active Fedora users than that. And I'll tell you, tell you why in a little bit. But, um, some of the things that complicate this, uh, network address translation, NAT, um, you're probably familiar this, with this from your home router. Basically, you've got a bunch of IP addresses on the inside, but to the outside world, it looks like just one. And in large institutions these days, because the world actually ran out of IP address space a couple years ago, um, and also for basically the privacy and security reasons that this gives you, 
often large institutions look like just one IP address or a handful of IP addresses. So if you're coming from Harvard University, there could be you know, 20,000 people running Fedora there. Hopefully there are. And, but this will count all of them as one. So that undercounts. On the other hand, if we have somebody who like, really likes coffee shops but um, also likes to walk around between them and goes to you know, two, three, four, five, 20 coffee shops a day that per and connects to their network and does you know, something that causes the updates to be checked, that person could be counted 20 times a day. So um, we don't know, but I suspect that the first thing under counting over count is um, much more than the people who are connecting a lot of times. Um, it is also the case that this overcounts people, or no, sorry, undercounts people who don't have broadband access because they're less likely to be online and checking into the update server. If you have to dial up to do it, you might decide to actually never do updates. And in fact, anybody who never does updates or installs new software is not counted. And that probably means that you're undercounted in cloud computing, where the, you, you make a gold image and you install it and it doesn't ever check in. And maybe you are running a million of them and never hitting the update server. Um, I hope that's true, but we don't have, because we don't have you know, invasive metrics, we can't really see those things. Okay, so uh, you may have been staring at these numbers on this graph and trying to decipher them. That's, that's nice if you want to do that, but I've also simplified it so you don't have to. This is our geologic ages of Fedora. So this is the same data, but I've stacked it so you can see the total amount is the amount of uh, Fedora we've got out there overall with the caveat of um, pretend that the number over here is magical y-axis number, not some sort of thing that necessarily means something directly. But again, I think the relative numbers are meaningful. So this is um, back old releases here. Uh, the light blue is Fedora 8, which was, was just slipping back here so you can see the peak. This was an oddly popular release, and um, I mean, that's good that it's popular. We still don't have a really good explanation for why. Uh, one of our theories is that it was one of the early images available for Amazon EC2, big public cloud provider, and uh, it was, not only was it available uh, early on, but it was also one of the only images. Uh, and then when we got to Fedora 9, uh, we broke support for the virtualization technology for good reason, but you know, we there no longer was support for the virtualization technology Zen that uh, they use in Amazon or used in Amazon, and so Fedora 8 didn't have that boost. Uh, Fedora 9 didn't have that boost, and we actually that that works again now, but there was a period where it didn't, and so Fedora 8 hung on for many many years there. So that's the theory of the Fedora 8 spike. But if you've got a different theory, I'd love to hear it. We don't really know. Uh, anyways, after that, we have the purple age of Fedora here, where we had a nice upward trend there. Basically, that goes from 9 through Fedora 14. Uh, things were going pretty well, although I think you can kind of see it's kind of a slowing off curve there. So um, when we got to Fedora 15 here, uh, this is a release that we had a disturbing thing happen, and I'm going to go flip back to here again, where we had peak there, and this is the upward trend, and then, uh-oh, we didn't, Fedora 15 actually at its peak never even exceeded the Fedora 14 installations. Um, there are a number of finger, fingers, that's a, uh, things and finger pointing together is fingers. A bunch of uh, possible weight reasons for that and obviously we made a lot of change in that release. Uh, so GNOME 3 first hit there and that was also our first release with Systemd. Um, there were other things going on at the time. So. Uh, that was a lot of change, and so one theory is, boy, that change scared a lot of people and scared them away, and um, that was bad. It could be something else, but um, we had this downward trend for a while, and that was a little bit disturbing. Uh, so when we got to the 10 years of Fedora point, as you can see from my shirt, uh, we decided, okay, we've had a pretty successful 10 years of Fedora. Um, downward trend notwithstanding, Fedora is pretty awesome. Uh, but we need to make sure that we uh, have you know, the right operating system for the next 10 years. What do we need to do to make it look like that? And so for Dora 20, we took one year to do that release rather than the normal six months. So I separated that one out separately as the yellow release. So Fedora 20 was a really nice solid release, but it was kind of in the same mode as the other one. We just kind of retooled our infrastructure to do things differently. And then with Fedora 21, we have this new strategy of uh, separating out the Fedora workstation, Fedora Server and Fedora Cloud editions. And I can go into great length about that strategy and why we chose it. 
but part of it is by having these things in different targets, we can try and really appeal to a specific area and get things right for the people who want to use that and then hopefully grow from there to you know world domination, which is obviously always the goal. And we can see from that, um, this green is really going up at a nice steep line. If we can keep it going like that, um, we really actually will be at world domination in, I don't know, not, not many more slides on from this, so that, that's exciting. Um, I, probably not sustainable, but I hope so. You can see that we're actually at the peak, where our peak now is higher than the previous peak back there. So we're on, we're on track for there. And so here I've um, made an even more simplified version of it. This version, basically the green line is the top of the stack there, total Fedora, and then for each individual release, this is the point at which that release peaked. And so here's the F8 weirdness over here, uh, good weirdness, but weirdness nonetheless. And then you can see back over here at this end, um, Fedora 22, very high. Now I had to put a note here because when I first showed this to my boss, she freaked out. Oh my goodness, what do we do wrong with Fedora 23? The answer is, we're not at the time for Fedora 24 yet. And it turns out that the peak for each release is basically the days or day right before a new release comes out. So Fedora 22, um, well, Fedora 22 hit its popularity the day before Fedora 23 came out. And so back to marketing, this has kind of some interesting implications. Again, since this is the director's cut, I'll diverge a little bit. Um, we've traditionally structured our sort of marketing cycle and activities around this six month release cycle. And that's like we decide, you know, we've got new features, we're gonna try and push people to the new releases here. And we do a good job of pushing, I mean, people, people do get excited about the new releases, they switch. But the fact is, Fedora like user growth keeps happening throughout the life cycle of the release at a pretty smooth upward curve and only stops when we get to that new releases there. So it kind of indicates that um, we don't need the six month releases to drive new users. And in fact, when we had you know, the year long Fedora 20, that still was an upward curve that whole time. Um, there are some good technical reasons we want to do six month releases. There's a lot of upstream projects like GNOME that are on a six month cycle. So working with that um, is beneficial and it kind of is nice to have an uh, integration cadence that moves quickly um, or, you know, it's two years, uh, uh, a release every uh, two releases a year is not really quickly in the state of agile and continuous delivery, um, but that's another topic. Um, six months or maybe faster sometimes useful from a technical point of view. From a marketing point of view, it might not be doing all that much, and so maybe we could try and focus our marketing on things that are not necessarily so tuned to the release cycle. Okay, um, so this slide is kind of a little bit of a diversion. This is some correlating data, really. So we have, I was saying that we basically are counting people by observing activity in the wild. And some of that activity here uh, is, is the update server connection. Another thing that we thought we could count, um, so if you go to a coffee shop or like at the university here, you connect to an open wireless network and then you get to a, a portal page that pops up and it's subverted your DNS and you can't actually get to the internet until you type in some login or if you're at an airport, watch an annoying advertisement or some sort of thing like that. And so uh, we have a feature which helps understand if you are in that environment and then pops up a login screen, sort of just like you will get on basically other operating systems today have the same comparable technology for captive portal detection. And this is a long way of saying, in order to do this, it tries to load a certain URL on the Fedora web server. And if that comes back with actually literally the word okay, you know that you can get to the internet. Otherwise it will come back with something else and you know everything is being tricked. So we can count the number of people who hit that okay and see the number of people who are using Fedora on their desktop and going around to coffee shops or not. Uh, and uh, this is the line, this is the feature that was added in Fedora 21. So obviously it was, um, this is people down here, there's a few people who were testing it here, but as it started becoming the default, uh, we can see that line going up and this kind of correlation that we're not crazy on exactly what our numbers are measuring. And one of the reasons that this number is lower than that one and even the slope is lower is that people who are upgrading from older releases don't necessarily get the new configuration until they, unless they actually pull it in on purpose. So uh, this is just kind of interesting correlating data for now, but as more people come on to these newer releases and actually going back to the ages one here, 
uh, you can see if you kind of slice right along here, you can see that most people are actually on one of our recent releases, which is actually, again, back, back to the Dark Ages. Um, the dark, can I call them that? I don't know. The, the, this period here, we had a lot of people who were clinging on to the older releases and not upgrading. And so we actually have a case right now where most of the people who are, excuse me, most of the people who are running Fedora are running Fedora on one of the newer releases. So that means as we look into the future, the red line is going to be closer to the green line and we can use that for some interesting comparisons. So. Another thing we can count is ISO downloads. This is when you go to getfedora.org and click on Get Fedora, the download link there. And uh, so here, again, this comes from mirrors. So what we're counting is not actual successful downloads, but we're counting when people uh, tried to start a download on the website. And uh, Smooge has done a lot of work to try and filter out bots and automatic you know, robotic connections here. So we have reasonable confidence that these are humans downloading Fedora installer. And of course, we don't know what they did with that installer once they downloaded it. They could have installed one system, they could have thrown it in the trash, or they could have installed, you know, done an install fest and installed 20, 200 systems with it. We don't really know. And particularly with the cloud image, I think it's actually pretty likely that um, one is downloaded and then used many, many times. Uh, anyways, the punchline here, I guess, is that each of these blobs uh, is about 1.2 million downloads. So that is quite a lot for each release. And uh, so that's one of the things, you know, when, when our uh, access goes up to 100,000 on the other releases, I think that we probably have better conversion than, um, you know, one out of, nine out of ten people throwing away the download after they've downloaded it. So the number is probably somewhere in between there. And another thing that is worth noting, you may have been staring at this and wondering, why are those peaks going down? I thought you were talking about peaks going up. Well, when you do an upgrade from one release of Fedora to another, now you don't need to download an ISO to do that. It's an online upgrade um, where you type some commands. And uh, so basically people who are upgrading aren't going to get the ISO. Now I would like that still, we'd be in better shape if it were actually going up new users um, every release more and more. But I'm not surprised to see this going down. Uh, but I hope that we can eventually turn that around as well. Uh, so this is Another way of looking at the download numbers, this is basically which percentage of them are which Fedora edition, cloud server or workstation. And we can see of the editions, about 75% uh, are workstation downloads here. And then server is the orange. And this is, again, this is the axis here is different. Some of this older graphs went far back. This just shows uh, of the last couple of years when we've had the, uh, the split in the editions and had um, that as our primary downloads. So a uh, pretty good chunk, you know, 15% or so for server. And then uh, a little bit low, a little lower for a cloud and atomic, which is our new uh, container-based operating system, which currently is cloud-focused as well. Um, those things are, yeah, uh, small, smaller up there at the top, but we think that people who are doing cloud images, hopefully, again, are downloading one and installing a lot of it, and we don't really count that very well with this metric. Uh, there's an interesting gray blob in the middle that is a network install, and so a network install basically is you download the, a smaller ISO, and then when you actually go to do the installation, it at that time pulls everything off the network. Um, that's useful for geeky power users, and it's also very common for institutional use. So if you're installing a university, or if this is you know, Fedora is your corporate desktop, which that's a thing that happens, um, <laughs> then that means that um, that that's uh, something people want. And we actually had previously we only had network install for server because the thinking was it's really server people who want this, you know. Um, this power use of the installer. But it turned out we had a lot of people saying, so where is this for workstation? I really, I really need this. And so we added it back in for Fedora 20, 22 in the middle here. I think that's when that was. And you can see that um, demand was real because that gray uh, line is fairly significant. There. So that's. So in addition to the main additions, we have we also have a bunch of other things called spins and labs. Spins are alternate desktop environments. Fedora Workstation is based on GNOME because, uh, not because um, there's like a secret agenda to promote GNOME above all things, but when we said we want to make this Fedora Workstation and have it be something that is specifically dedicated to our target market, blah, 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 blah. 
Uh, Red has a lot of people working on GNOME, and Fedora has traditionally had a very strong GNOME, good, good strong GNOME relationship, and so that's people who showed up to do it, and it, we chose it as the best option for that particular use. But these other desktops, of course, especially in the Linux enthusiast community, are very important and interesting, and we think it's pretty cool that we can offer all this different diversity. Uh, we added a cinnamon spin. I'll show some of the breakdown here. Um, if we go to this slide, I just have um, a non-stack, yeah, right, the, this is not stacked, and it is just the representation of the spins, um, not, not the additions here. So you can see KDE is clearly our most popular, um, and with cinnamon, rising up here, it's the yellow line here, which probably is hard to see in the projector, but um, Cinnamon added recently and that being jumping into popularity and um, LXDE and XFCE kind of fighting it out for second place there. Um, a lot of sysadmins love the uh, XFCE. Uh, so the, the spins are alternate desktops. We also have this thing called labs. Labs may have an alternate desktop, but they're mostly focused on being a purpose-built collection of software. So we have some of them like the electronic spin with tools for you know, building, building electronics. Uh, games spin, obviously, which is preloaded with games and uh, that kind of stuff. And uh, two of them, I think, are particularly interesting here. One of them, uh, it's low at the bottom here, but is the Fedora security spin, but there's kind of this cool little bump right there. The security spin is um, like uh, penetration testing, forensics, all kinds of things around the field of you know, computer security and uh, hopefully white hat hacking. And so this is something that I, I know is used in schools, and I expect that this big jump right here was a class where somebody said, we're going to be using Fedora Security Spin for something you know, we're doing here. So I think that, that's pretty cool. And another one that is a low line on the graph, barely, barely downloaded at all, is the Fedora Robotics Spin, which um, it is, uh, I think, disproportionately uh, impactful, can I say that, for, um, for, what, for the number of downloads because uh, the people who make this and work on it also use it to routinely win Robot World, so World Cup Soccer, uh, which is awesome. It's pretty cool that that's being done with Fedora and our Fedora spins and the technology we use to put together. You know, the operating system can be used for all sorts of neat things like that. Okay. Architectures. So this is uh, this, and the next slide are breakdowns of basically um, what kind of computer people are running things on. And so this is uh, 64 big red 64-bit Intel AMD uh, normal computers. Here is 32-bit, which is actually much higher than I expected it to be when I went to look at this. And up there at the top, we've got the yellow uh, ARM architecture, and that's all ARM32. Uh, ARM64 is negligible on this, and some of our other architectures. We have Fedora for the S390. Um, people who want to run Fedora on the mainframe, you are welcome to do it, and some people do. It's just that the number of mainframes out there is, you know, not enough to make a dent in our charts, but Fedora, Fedora is really there. Uh, and PowerPC is also, uh, the new PowerPC stuff is incredibly fast. And so uh, we have Fedora for PowerPC as well, but it is also making only small dents in our chart. But uh, if you're interested in that, we've got it. Uh, so this is the same thing over a longer axis. The previous one was downloads, and so this one is the update server connection. And uh, we can see basically the previous graph is this part of the chart. And one of the things I noticed is that ARM, even though it's still small, is a higher percentage. I think that's because people who download the ARM images probably use them multiple times, and so you have multiple systems for one image they've downloaded. Um, I think it's interesting also that 32-bit you know, was on this big crash to zero, and then, whoops, hit a floor at 20. And one of the things that I think might be responsible for this is in our new download page, we have, um, you go to getfedora.org and go to the Fedora Workstation site, and you'll see at the top of the page, there's a pretty banner that says download now and has a nice green button. And if you're like me and you browse the web a lot, you might sometimes get in the habit of skipping past the top where it's blah, 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 pretty stuff. Where's the meat of this page? And it happens that in our current design, we've got an other downloads link section over there, and that starts with things that aren't the main download, starting with the 32-bit download. So I have a little bit of a concern that people are just missing the actual thing that's supposed to be obvious, click this, ignore the rest, and actually looking at the download link. So uh, I'm gonna do some A-B testing with the websites team so we can actually experience and see how that affects people. Uh, 
And this is one of the things I think is kind of fun about you know, looking at the data here and saying, wait a minute, this doesn't come out with what I can expect, what kind of causes, we can do experiments, it's fun. Ah, I'm a huge nerd, data is fun. Okay, uh, so this slide, switching, switching track a little bit, uh, this is Apple, Apple is enterprise packages, no, extra packages for enterprise Linux, and it is basically Fedora packages, Fedora RPMs, recompiled to build on CentOS and RHEL. And this is hugely popular, and it continues to go up and up and up in popularity. And you can actually see that somewhere around 2011, uh, it crossed in popularity from people downloading, uh, accessing the Fedora OS to people using uh, the, the Apple packages. That's uh, one of the biggest services we provide. And I think that's testament, of course, to the success of RHEL and CentOS, so that's cool. And you know, the, the really vast audience for those kind of uh, stable downstream platforms. But it's also a neat thing where we're kind of tied in to those communities where we have something that's kind of a bridge across to what's happening in CentOS. And I think uh, it's also, it's a neat thing that we have that in the Fedora project and not isolated because it brings in people who want to contribute and add things to the distribution at uh, sort of the upstream level that Fedora wants to be at. Okay, so those were all numbers on Fedora, the operating system. But Fedora as a project is more than just an operating system. In fact, I really like to think of it as mostly a project and a community and an operating system as one of the things we are just organized around making. Uh, so uh, previously, one of the questions people asked me a lot was, how big is that community you keep talking about? And I would make up some numbers, and then I started thinking, I should stop making up numbers and try and figure out what those numbers actually are. So the first question, how big is the Fedora contributor community? And now this takes um, some amount of explanation to figure out where I got these numbers from and also how, um, how much we can trust them, just like the big dinosaur. I don't have a dinosaur for this one, but I probably should put in like a pterodactyl or something to make a warning. Um, so we have this thing called Fed Message, the Fedora message bus, or it's actually now the federated message bus, I think, because it is not used just by Fedora. Debian uses it, and um, I think CentOS is looking at it. Uh, and so basically this is a message bus that anytime somebody does something in the Fedora infrastructure, or many times automated systems do things in the Fedora infrastructure, a little bit of data is put on the bus saying, you know, who did what when and what happened and the results of it. And so there's a lot of different activity that causes message bus to happen. And we use it for a lot of things, connecting services together. You know, if this happens, respond in this way. It's the way as a contributor, you can get a notification. Like if you want to know whenever a certain wiki page is edited, you can get a notification that way. Um, you can get notifications about some pack, if some package changes, if there's a new version of a package, you can, uh, you can hook it up to our notifier. And so there are a lot of different activities, and some of these activities have some useful properties for counting contributors, like, for example, they're attached to a username. And specifically, there are some which are attached to a username and are initiated by someone who actually did something. So it's not just that something happened to that user or something automated happened related to the user, but the user sitting at a keyboard and did some action that we can count. And of those as well, there's a subset which are actually the user is logged in. So we can actually you know, know that this is a certain user with a certain Fedora account that we can um, trust to be the same over time and not be just some made up pseudonym. So uh, that's why I say activity in three key areas that are also easily counted. So I don't know that this is actually representational of everything and I actually have some reasons to believe that it's not. Let me go through the areas though. Uh, first, Bodhi. Bodhi is our updates QA system, basically. So when a packager takes, you know, fixes a bug or has a security problem that's fixed, uh, we put this into the system. They put it on Bodhi, which is a website where anyone can run it, you know, do a testing, and then they can give uh, karma feedback, positive or negative. This fixed my problem. Oh my goodness, this is broken and terrible. And so votes get counted up or down. And uh, that's kind of an important process because if you don't get enough feedback on your updates, it's risky to release them. In the future, we will have awesome continuous integration and automated testing on these things. Right now, it depends on the community to do it. And it turns out we actually have a pretty large community of people doing that, over a thousand people in 2015 who actually did that. So that's the Bodhi here. Um, Diskit 
is actually the package changes themselves. Whenever somebody makes that update to a package and commits it to Git, a message goes out saying they did that. Smaller number, but still a significant number of people involved in that. And then the wiki. And you may think, oh yes, documentation. And then you would be horribly wrong. Because the Fedora wiki is great for many things, and there is some documentation on it, but it is not really a documentation site. What it is, is an office whiteboard and um, various other office implements. It is a workspace that people use in the project for doing a lot of different things. In fact, uh, QA uses it for validation testing. Um, and a, a lot of people use either home, kind of home page kind of things on there for users. Uh, and people put draft ideas there. There also is some project contributor documentation. But uh, mostly, this is um, contributor activity of all kinds. You can't say, OK, this is docs. So those are the things that are easy to measure because they generate fed message things. So there are some things like the documentation, which isn't measured very well in this. Uh, translations would be another big area that um, I don't have data on. Um, working in Bugzilla, uh, Bugzilla uses different accounts than the Fedora accounts, so I didn't include that. Um, there's also ask.fedoraproject.org, different accounts, so I didn't, didn't include it in this right now. Um, and the ambassadors tend to do a whole lot of work going to conferences, talking, spreading, spreading the love for Fedora that um, doesn't necessarily generate any of this sort of activity. Maybe a few wiki edits, but maybe not, not a huge amount of activity there. So those aren't counted. But of the things that are counted, we do have more than 2,000 contributors who did at least something in 2015, and quite a lot of those active in multiple areas. So, this slide, I actually went and looked and said, okay, there's that, that's people who did at least one thing. What if people, you know, who's really active? Somebody, you know, some people might just do drive-by things there. Do we have a really a core community that does, you know, does a lot? And so here I just took in each of these three areas the top 10% and said, okay, we're gonna count who, who was really putting in a lot of this work here. Um, and it turns out it's about 300 people who uh, in 2015 were you know, in the top 10% of activity. It turns out to be it's quite a lot of activity here. And one of the things I think is interesting is there's a lot less overlap than I expected. You can see there's more overlap in this chart than there was in the wider one, which makes sense. But I kind of expected this to be almost all on top of each itself, and it's not, which actually to me indicates that there's probably some other missing bubbles that also add up another, you know, another couple hundred people who could be contributed, considered in the core that didn't actually get it get to this graph. Um, but it, even 300 is a pretty respectably healthy project, I think. I would like to grow it more. That's definitely one of the goals. But I think we're in pretty good shape there. Uh, so uh, time to break this down a little bit more. Uh, this is, since this is the director's cut edition here, this is kind of a super nerdy breakdown of those specific areas, and I thought this was really fascinating. So uh, it looks complicated, but it looks more complicated than it is, I think, so to trust me here. So this is the Bodhi feedback update numbers. And so what I did is counted the number of people per week. So when it goes up to 150 in this week here, see 150 different distinct people gave at least one bit of feedback that week there. And so uh, this is a stacked graph, so that's the top, the top number there. It basically shows the amount of activity that week, and it ranges from a low of around 30 here up to the high of 150 in some busy week. And you see it's very spiky. I think that's because you know, the number of updates varies per week quite a bit, so that's that as well. Um, but then um, the coloration basically is broken down into buckets based on how active that particular user was, not was not just in that week, but in the quarter that that week happens to be in. Uh, and it's actually, again, nerdy. It is a rolling quarter, so it's um, that week plus the six weeks before and after, um, because I didn't want it to be skewed by weird date you know, breaks. Uh, but so that you can basically see it broken down there and I have a more useful view for seeing that bit broken down by contributor activity So this is the exact same data, but the graph is instead of being a count It is a percentage so it's a filled in graph here. So basically that means that top blue up there is um, 50% the bottom 50% of contributors in, in a quarter are uh, doing about 10% of the work. So 10% of the feedback comes from drive throughs is basically what that means. And this is the 1% here doing a pretty hefty chunk here, the top, top 1% does not. But that next 10%, um, basically the top total 10%, the yellow and the green together, uh, works out to be about 2 thirds of the effort 
in uh, doing this particular feedback. And actually, as I look through all these different areas, we see that same kind of pattern that we're 10% and two thirds, um, which I think is pretty good. It would be kind of it would be nicer if we had a bigger long tail, more, more drive-throughs, more lightweight contributors. And I think that's one of the things we can kind of work on doing, make it easier to give that kind of uh, feedback and work. But there's a like a social media rule, the you know 90-10 rule, which is you know 10% does 90% of the work, or maybe more than that. And you can see we're better off than that with two thirds. So I think that's actually also this is pretty healthy here. Um, so. Uh, this is that same slide basically for the package changes, the disk get activity, and um, there are exciting dips here. Christmas, Christmas, and Christmas. Uh, so I think that that's kind of fun because again, uh, when you're doing something with data and you see a weird artifact and you're like, oh yeah, that is clearly explained by something in the real world. Um, it helps you know that your data is actually connected to the real world in some way and it's not just abstract numbers. And uh, Red Hat shuts down for Christmas and a lot of people you know, uh, outside of Red Hat contributors are on vacation and doing family things. And so we see this big dip in activity. It doesn't go to zero. Some people are still slaving away over the break, um, which is important, especially when security is concerned. But um, there's definitely that big dip. Um, so this is um, the same thing. Uh, for um, the package changes, again, with the, the percent per bucket. And this one has some spikes that are not Christmas, but in going the other way here, uh, the Christmas actually flattens out, so you can barely see it in here where um, it's like you know, here's a Christmas here. The percentage stays about the same over that break. But these spikes are release engineering doing something called a mass rebuild, which is, as you might think, when we rebuild a whole chunk of packages, in fact, all of them, we often rebuild the entire Fedora distribution uh, as compiler changes happen, new security features are added, and sometimes just to make sure that um, everything hasn't bit rotted. So um, everything is done basically by a release engineering team, which is a core handful of people who are very active already. And so that makes these spikes of the 1% having done a bunch of the extra work that week, drowning out the you know, normal, normal workflow for that week. Um, and actually, Dennis Gilmore, who's one of the uh, key Fedora release engineering people, uh, just yesterday, the day, the day before that, uh, switched from using his personal Fedora account for doing this to using a new release engineering account. So in future versions of the graph, I will be able to separate those out completely without also discounting other oh, Dennis. I could have just blacklisted Dennis but and Peter Robinson and a couple of people like that, uh, Rex Dieter as well. Um, and that, that wouldn't have been fair to them to kick them out. So I didn't do that. But having a release engineering account will certainly help that. Um, this is the same thing for the wiki. You probably have the point by now. Uh, one thing that is different from the other ones, the other ones are kind of flat in growth. And again, I would like to see contributors going up, so that's something to work on. Um, you know, you got to have the numbers to have the baseline to know where you're working from, so it's good that we have this baseline now. But here we see the wiki activity, number of contributors to the wiki going down. And I said that the wiki was a whiteboard, not a documentation site. And I think that's the inevitable thing. This is basically wiki bloat that is killing the wiki's usefulness. And so uh, the good news is right now on the Fedora Docs mailing list, the Docs team is working on replacing this wiki solution with a new um, ASCII doc get based workflow, which will be a lot more lightweight than what we have now and will not be confused with the wiki. And I hope that once that's up, we can just basically put a banner at the top of the wiki that when you're not logged in, it will tell you. Welcome to the Fedora Project Wiki. This is a whiteboard for contributors. If you're looking for docs, you're definitely in the wrong place. Go to the docs thing over here. If you wanted a whiteboard, awesome, log in. Because we're not going to get rid of the wiki. It's way too useful. But we also don't want people going there thinking that they're going to get useful documentation because it's a trap. Uh, here's the breakdown by percent. I think the only thing worthwhile of noting here after all the other stuff is that we're still following that same uh, 10%, 60% pattern here that the other stuff does. So that's kind of a pattern across the project. And since it works that way in three areas, I'm going to just go ahead and assume that it's basically that way for everything because that's uh, extrapolation works that way, right? Okay. So uh, there is enough of an, uh, the, the deep dive analysis into the numbers there. Um, 
I also have uh, in, in the numbers section some other interesting numbers that I have not gone into in such deep exploration, but I would like to in the future. Some other areas to an analyze, and I've got a couple graphs that basically talk about different things. So this is Fedora Magazine. Fedora Magazine is something we started I don't know, three or four years ago, but it really only started two years ago in being really active, and the team working on this is awesome. If you have not checked it out, fedoramagazine.org. So this is user-focused documentation and articles of things of interest, um, ranging from highly technical to um, community pieces about you know people who are involved. And this has just gone up and up and up in popularity. Uh, the red dots here are, um, this is per month, so those are months in which there was a Fedora release. And obviously that drives extra interest. But you can see even without, even in not those months, we've got a nice, if you pretend the red doesn't exist and draw a line right there, that's a nice upward slope as well. So uh, congratulations to the mag magazine team here. And this is becoming really important. I started this presentation off with some press, and we get great press, but the thing is, it is hard for a Linux distribution to get any press these days, because although I hope everybody listening to this distribution knows that Linux is cool, in the general populace, it is not really a hot topic, and it is not something that sells magazines and drives general IT page views, uh, unless we have drama, and we try to keep all of our drama positive, and then who wants positive drama? That's not, it, it doesn't make good press. So it's hard to, uh, you know, I talk to even friendly journalists, and they're like, I love what you're doing, I don't have a story. So um, having the Fedora Magazine basically gives us an outlet to talk about ourselves, and people who are interested, uh, we'll show those press what's cool. Uh, so again, we're on a chart towards world domination here, and soon we'll be bigger than Gizmodo. Okay, uh, so this is random stats gathering on the Fedora developer mailing list. You can kind of see the same trend of graphing here. Um, this is basically new users showing up to the Fedora developer mailing list over time, and um, I tried to break this down again into groups here. So the yellow is, or so the blue is a new user who posted that month and then is never seen again, drive-bys there. The red is new users who posted that month and then posted uh, just one other month. So they're uh, kind of drive-by and then, yeah. And then the yellow are users who showed up that month and then uh, stayed around. And obviously, because of counting that way, there's nobody here. That doesn't mean we didn't get any new users. I just can't tell if they've stayed around yet or not. So this is why this one gets relegated to the back of the presentation, because I'm not quite sure how to present this the best. But I'm showing it to you anyways, because I think it's kind of interesting. I mean, obviously, one of the things we want to be doing is every month getting more contributors and getting ones that stay around. And you can see, like, we haven't scared off everybody. We've definitely get new users you know, over the last couple years. New users come, and new users do stick around. Um, and that's something we obviously want to, to encourage and emphasize. Um, Fedora mailing lists have especially had some reputation of being uh, sometimes uh, prone to getting into gigantic flame fests, a little bit being harsh. And in uh, uh, the last couple of years, we've really tried to stop that, both um, by enforcing our code of conduct, telling people you are out of line, remember to be excellent to each other, and also uh, by doing the same sort of thing when a thread is just going off the rails and going in circles back and forth, productive discussion has stopped. Um, even if it hasn't gotten to be acrimonious, that kills the mailing list when there are threads like that because you, you don't want to just, you two people going back and forth about something. So we ask people gently, okay, we got it now. It's time to shut down the thread. And usually people are listening to that. So that makes the mailing list more pleasant. And I hope that we can actually see activity in these lists going up um, over the next couple of years and more new users. And I've got some other ways I'm thinking of analyzing the mailing list. So um, in future versions of this presentation, so much more mailing list analysis, it's going to be awesome. Okay, uh, this is IRC meetings. This is one of our interesting stats, and this graph looks like noise, so I drew a red, red average line across here. Uh, sort of the important thing here, this is IRC meetings completed every week, and this is approximately three meetings a day, something like this is over the last two years, so 
Yeah, we've gone up to basically 25 IRC meetings a week. And a lot of these are, you know, half hour to an hour long, people chatting back and forth, making things go in the, pro in the project. And this is really the engine that drives Fedora development. We have, you know, the, the mailing list activity happens, but IRC is, you know, real-time higher bandwidth. So people get a lot of work done this way. We go through tickets and cr crank things off. And so one of the things I'm concerned with is that this is iceberg activity because Although IRC is awesome, open source people use it like crazy, and you know, hacker script kitties use it like crazy, the rest of the world does not use it, even though for some reason they're using Slack now, and Slack's not really anything different, it's just got a brand name on it. That's a really a sidetrack. Anyways, IRC as it is, is hard to get into, and that's what Slack offers, an easy way to get into something like IRC. IRC is great, but um, it's really just below the surface, and especially as a new user, um, getting, in, getting into IRC, you've got to go like, what's a Nick serve? What's a Chan serve? Why am I getting kicked out? Of, what's getting kicked out of a channel? What's a channel? Is this like CB radio? I don't know what's going on. I get. So the technology is confusing and then the culture is confusing because people use, you know, um, all that tech speaking stuff. Like that, that's IRC stuff that spilled out into popular culture. It's, it's, uh, it's true. Uh, I see my, my daughter on Minecraft doing all these IRC, you know, the chat stuff. It's like, you, you're, you'll be ready to be a hacker. Um, but for most people, it's really a big barrier to entry. And so, and not only, and, and it is also something that is, you, you don't see it. You go to the Fedora Project website, you don't see that all this is going on. It looks like, is, is this project dead? No, we are not. We are very alive. We are just hiding in caves we've tunneled into an iceberg. Uh, so, uh, and again, these slides are a random collection, so segue to something completely different. Um, this is people voting in the elections for the Fedora Technical Steering Committee, FESCO, over time. And this is going all the way back to 2008, when I think, I, I don't know if that's the first elections. It's the first elections we have numbers for. And you can see this is about 200 users, which I actually think, I mean, it's a, the, it, the graph jumps up and down a little bit, but it's kind of constant over time around there, and I think that's kind of concerningly low, given that you know, I just said we had more than 2,000 people active in these you know, core technical areas in the project last year, and you know, over 300 of them who are you know, really active, people are not voting very much. So um, at, as with you know, uh, elections in government, we have a problem with low voter turnout that uh, and maybe it means everybody's super happy with the leadership. Maybe it means people are heads down hacking and don't want to deal with politics. That's not necessarily bad, bad things there. But um, it's interesting that the number is low. Okay, now again, a random segue to a slide I think is also super interesting. And I did a lot of work on this one. Does everybody at Fedora work for Red Hat? Obviously, Fedora is sponsored by Red Hat, and Red Hat puts in a huge amount of money and effort and all sorts of things into the project. And it is often a perception in you know, the press that Fedora is a Red Hat joint. Uh, and Red, Fedora is a Red Hat joint collaboration, but it is not an entirely Red Hat thing. And I think, uh, so I went and actually looked. So I took those top, those top users from back from the second Venn diagram there, the, the active users in 2015, and I did some analysis, analysis to see, you know, is this someone from Red Hat? And so 26% of those people use the redhat.com address, so those people were easy. And then I actually had to go through by hand because we have a whole bunch of Red Hatters sneakily using other domains, um, which I need some explanation because I say sneakily, but um, there are actually a lot of good reasons people do that. A lot of these people are Fedora contributors that, yeah, for long before they were Red Hatters and were hired into Red Hat and they had uh, either a personal identity established as, you know, just as, as a person in, in the internet, as a lot of people do, or uh, like me, I hope I have a personal identity, but more importantly, all of my email filters for dealing with the thousands of messages on these lists live on a server somewhere, and I was not about to port that into my Red Hat address and have that all mixed up. So my Fedora mail goes somewhere different from my Red Hat address, and so that puts me in the sneakily, sneaky domain there. It's not any lack of pride in being a Red Hatter or wanting to disguise that uh, involvement. It's just... Uh, those, those kind of things there. So I say sneakily, but I'm saying that as a joke. I don't think anybody's actually being uh, stealthy in that way. Anyways, 
uh, the basic thing here is that adds up to about a third of the core contributors being Red Hatters. And I show a lot of people this and they're like, wow, that's actually surprising. I, uh, a lot of people are worried really that Red Hat is, has um, putting in, you know, pulling in a, a bigger share of that. And that, that, I think that would be unhealthy for the project if it were, you know, 90% Red Hat and then a few other uh, poor souls trapped along. But we can see really Red Hat is, is a, big stakeholder, red hatters are big stakeholders, but uh, not the majority. So that's really kind of an interesting thing to see there. Um, you know, if you slice this down to the top 1%, um, I think it gets a little bit bigger, but that's because something like this is pretty hard. It's hard to be in the top 1% if it's, you're not fortunate enough for that to be your full-time job, which is also why many of these people got into this chunk because they were doing an awesome job and Red Hat's like, we could use more of that. So, uh, there's that. Okay, so that is the end of the statistics part of my talk.